that are manufacturing that product. And you can go to that company's page and then further search on all the products that they have or supply. It's kind so of like an Amazon for manufacturing. Exactly. Okay. But how does Alibaba get paid then? They're, they're showing you where to go. They're, get, they're getting, well, a lot of times, I think they're also taking the orders through Alibaba. Um, they just know that you're somehow. Right. Like so contacting portal, them through. I guess a portal yeah. would make it more efficient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, or they, you know, like a lot of intermediaries, they take a percentage of whatever the manufacturing is. Mm -hmm. Because the manufacturers, they don't have salespeople all over the world. Right. Um, so if someone, a rep, brings them someone, they, they take a percentage of whatever that manufacturing right. cost is. And that's a pre negotiated thing because the manufacturers, that's how they get their orders. And it doesn't cost you any more, it would probably cost you more if you didn't use an intermediary, believe me, because you'd get the wrong product shipped, it wouldn't be right. Intermediaries are really in, in, you know, invaluable. So have you worked in where you had to work with some customer service stuff where you had to return things or things weren't right? Or mm -hmm. they are Not with Alibaba. Oh, okay. Yeah, with a, another intermediary here in Denver that was sourcing things in China, yes. Uh, we went through them and, and it really wasn't his fault um, and the manufacturer took care of it so it wasn't an issue but from my my own experience sourcing from China I've never had one order come correct that's the norm not the exception mm -hmm. so when they give you a quote of three months make it six months in your mind oh, or some timing Oh, yeah. Some timing, yeah. Yeah. They, they, right. yeah. I did some consulting with a manufacturing company. Um, let's say it's Steel Gate, Steel uh, up in Commerce City, sometime ago. They manufacture um, uh, iron rods for like railings and stairway things, and also fasteners for doors and fancy hardware. Um, and unfortunately, before I got to them, I came in to do a, um, an overall analysis of their marketing, give them a report on what they needed to do, because they were, they were going in all different directions. But to make a long story short, they did this big announcement of this new hardware they were going to be launching into, I think it was Lowe's at the time, um, a new line of hardware, and it was promised for September something. They had all the media, PR sent out on it, public, you know, everything was out. Well, they didn't allow enough time. The product arrived three months after. So they should have got the product first before they even yes. guaranteed anything. Or yeah. So yeah, they lost a lot of business, and I think they end up closing that division of the company over it. Oof. It was a very profitable hardware line, but unfortunately they blew it. So the moral of the story, don't, don't promote until you have it. In inventory, and that's right. Not, not that, not that the post office calls you and says, "Oh, we've got a package here for you." Yeah, that it's, yeah. You want to look it over? <laughs> Make sure the measurements are right. It fits your product. <laughs> yeah, that there's nothing worse than stimulating market demand, and then like yeah. you're in the people's chain, and then you're even worse off because they're mad. And that's what these guys did. They went to a trade show, made the big announcement, everything else. And said product was going to be in the stores, they had orders in hand, mm. and orders never arrived. Mm. I mean, it, it, it was a you big see, nightmare. if you are from different country like me or the Italian, we know this stuff. Yeah. We were born that way, not to have it on time. And, uh, you know, it's part of our life. Here, when you say certain hour, you get it, that, that's different. So for most American people, you're used to that. Mm -hmm. But for me, uh, I feel like, well, that's how it goes anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just how it is. Any company in Europe, well, I don't care who it is, that's just how it is. You know, they'll yeah. find an excuse, whatever excuse you want, they'll find it being late. And you know, that's, it's just, it's really normal. When you say three months, that's not bad. Your customer you know. should know that. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the customer should know. That's right. It's so like Mexico. Manana, manana. But how does that work then when you get on the legal side and you have There is no legal side in uh, No, there's no uh, legal no, side. There's always find a legal excuse to, 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 yeah. to take care of it. 
We have more attorneys here than any country in the we world. We have more attorneys in Denver yeah, per do, person than anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah. to Thank do you what? Know. You know, right. You know, so it's really uh, what you're saying is not a. Uh, 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 only in this country you feel actors. like you wait for the light to change, you pass. Right. See? When there is no car, people pass, you know, it doesn't matter. There is no, no problem. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mexico, no stop signs. The way you things put it are. Go. <laughs> the way things are, you know. So. <laughs> oh, uh, was, it, was your presentation there? You brought some. No, I was just going to. Um, talk about insurance issues that I have experienced oh, with okay, clients okay. Um, and going to trade shows and seeing no, I was going to talk about product liability which is related to uh -huh. insurance. Well, why don't you go ahead and talk about product liability and then I'll um, oh. fill in with uh, what my experience has been with people that I've worked with and All right. seen make um, bad decisions. Well, yeah. <laughs> we, we have also a presentation on product liability here at one time. Yeah. I think we did some yes, time ago. Somebody. Yes. It was the uh, Spring Ahern, Park. Bill Ahern Agency. Uh -huh. the one yeah. But uh, usually for inventors, the, the first insurance issue is product liability. That's like the first thing they think of instead of like general business, slip and fall, premises, or uh, litigation liability. It's product liability. So um, this is just a layout of what product liability is. Certainly, they're going to look at the inherent risk of the product. You know, is it inherently dangerous? Is it giving you pretty easy to relatively safe? The other thing they're going to look at is your volumes. Your higher volumes, of course, you're going to make higher insurance. So there's, there's more risk. So what you can do to protect yourself uh, on your side is to have the right caution. Thank you. 
great. Um, you have to try to anticipate how people are going to mess up using it. So that's all perceivable issues, and you have to like get down to it. Although, like a kitchen knife, there's really nothing you can do. <laughs> uh, people are going to perceivably misuse that to murder someone, but uh, you know, a lot of products <coughs> like, uh, say, a lawnmower, you know, it has a dead man switch on the handle, so if someone tries to pick it up and trim their hedge with it or something, you know, the motor will blow off because they're not holding the handle and there's a guard and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, you, you can research oh, probably Google and maybe even litigation histories to see what foreseeable misuses are. I mean, they have to be something that's normal but not outrageous. And so uh, the, the best histories on cars um, of course, a foreseeable misuse of a car is an accident, but how severe of accident? So, a rollover is not a foreseeable misuse. That's extremely reckless driving, and the manufacturers are not liable for damage and death and rollovers. But foreseeable misuse is a 30 to 40 mile an hour hit on collision and rear end collision, and now side so someone blowing a red light at a city intersection and hitting, that's a foreseeable issue. So they have to design for that so that the car doesn't blow up or severely injure people in that situation. And that's where you get classical steering columns, flexible bumpers, airbags. So these things, they're all good for, you know, moderate speed collisions and uh, the car not because obviously there's a lot of litigation history with, with cars. And so you kind of get a feel for this. Are you familiar with the Corvair story? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Did you study that history of the Corvair? And its yeah, that, that one, um, <coughs> I believe Corvair is what, and Ralph Nader is what is responsible for the collapsible steering column. Um, back in the early 60s, well, probably before 1960. I mean, safety equipment on a car was headlights, taillights, <laughs> driving turn signal. <coughs> so um, the Corvair had a rear engine that was a, a flat opposed six rear wheel drive. The front was the trunk and was common in those days. Uh, they had a solid rod steering wheel. Went to a steering box, which was a right angle burn gear and converted the steering rod turning to an arm moving the wheels. Well, all cars had this, but regular cars had a frame and an engine, and the steering box was back kind of beside the engine. So they got in a head-on, you hit all this other stuff first. The Corvair, the steering box was right up there behind the front bumper, and there was no solid structure. So when the Corvair got in a head-on, Collision, that steering rod, you know, just popped up and pushed the steering wheel right into the driver solid, and usually like collapsed their lungs. So that's where that came about. And then I think about the mid '60s. That was the first safety feature on cars. Is the steering column had a, it had like this metal thin part that was like this, and so if it got hit, it would, it would collapse axially and not drive the steering. Wheel. was another one that um, when they first went to unibody construction without frame, when the pinot got rear-ended, the body collapsed so much that the, uh, the gas tank hit the rear axle and split in two, and then, then it, it doused the occupants with gasoline, and the body collapsed and the, the, the doors closed and jammed. So you were stuck in the car, doused with gas, and you couldn't get out. So that brought about the gas tanks now are in the center of the car. So that if you take a hit on any side, the car has, can collapse several feet before the gas tank gets hit. And the same on electrics. Because um, electrics aren't any safer either, because that battery pack gets smashed and the battery short out. So that has to be, it's all got to be inboard. You can't have either the steering uh, rod, the steering box, or the, the uh, gas tank or batteries cannot be right next to the outer edge of the car. It's just way too dangerous. So anyway, that's um, 
you're supposed to design to accommodate. Um, Does that include anything as far as leaving warnings on labels or? or yeah, the warnings you, what you're doing legally is you're creating defenses for yourself. Like if somebody ignores a warning and gets hurt, you can say, you were told on the product, you were told in the instruction manual not to do this. So how much of that needs to go on the product and how much of that needs can be in the manual and how does that affect marketing as soon as you start putting all this crap on your product? Yeah, you have to, um, you don't want them too long. They have to be kind of short to the point, but I've got some information on that. you got to kind of pick out the worst ones. And the other thing is, uh, so the warning, you're, you're telling people, don't do this misuse. But there's another part to this, is that you're telling people, don't do this, uh, we call it material alteration. Don't break into the housing and monkey with stuff. <laughs> you know, that's where they always say, uh, don't open, no user serviceable parts and all this. So, um, you know, a lot of people altering stuff because it's designed to be a certain way. So when you label that, do you go to any government uh, situation with that or do you label it yourself? Uh, if there's applicable government regulation, you have to comply, but there may not be. What, what I am saying is that you create the label best to run it by an attorney. <coughs> then what you do is the insurance product liability insurance company will ask for a copy of your labeling. Or your packaging, right? If, if because if, if you're not showing everything on there that you need to be warning them about, or if it's not put on there correctly, they'll tell you. Yeah, <laughs> you, you do all this stuff to make them feel better, mm -hmm. and hopefully keep your rates better. So, speaking of what uh, Mike asked at the top of page two, this is how you're supposed to set up your warnings. Uh, you state the nature of the risk. You state how the risk is effectuated for the user and the consequences of the risk. So was that somewhere on those cars where you're going to burn and trap and <laughs> yeah, get the house for gasoline? <laughs> so like if, if, the, if the risk is a pinched finger, you say, you know, the risk is uh, pinching your finger. If you stick it here, which can result in, you know, uh, broken bone and serious injury. Word them not too long, but pretty, pretty hard to the point. And also, it's probably a good idea to like have some descriptive, uh, simple graphics next to it, so that overcomes the language problem. You know, like you can show like, the, you know, the cartoon strip, right? Like, like three or four graphics, like, don't do this, you know, you'll get hurt or something. And then uh, item eight, uh, this is when you get a uh, number of products out in the market, you know, they'll nail you, uh, like if someone sues you for product liability for not keeping up with these things, like uh, warranty claims, you need to keep a record of what the claims are and how you fix them. You know, you have to have serial numbers on the products and you keep a history of each product. And if you have to do a recall, work it that way so some things don't you got to show that you're numbers, keeping track of kind of this whole family of products out there and what's going on in them and a lot of people are reporting a certain problem that you're taking care of it you know, so how would you know which ones need serial numbers and because then you wouldn't be able to track well if you're if you you know like with a lot of them I kind of know there's a warning here this gonna need a serial number some things not only need serial numbers, but every single product has to have a change in serial number. So when you're getting something manufactured, if the serial number has to be built into the product or put a label on it, you need to know that too because that's going to change your pricing structure if every one of them has to have a uh, not just a lot number and serial number, but it needs a unique serial number. You know, if you look yeah. at uh, a microwave oven that you have, um, you may have a model serial number on there, but other things like a, like a vehicle has a VIN number. That's basically a, a very unique serial number for each vehicle. If you have a problem with a product, you'll know, want to know when and where it was made, right. 
it's right. hard to kind of identify and isolate these things. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and you know, recalls, uh, they get political and they can be costly. <laughs> Sometimes they're government required, certainly in, in mm -hmm. like vehicles or something, but on a regular product, I don't know, you can probably be good PR if you work it right. You know. But it, it's something you need to keep track of. Um, there's, and there's also a particular length of time in which for certain products you must carry replacement parts. And, yeah, uh, and I'm not... Uh, Five years has been kind of a rule of thumb, but is some there strict regulation on that, or is that pretty open? It's I think it's pretty much per product. There was ten years on cars. Yeah, some that's what I'm saying. Some some products will be different than others, but let's say you've got a bread maker or something, it may be five years that they keep you know replacement parts available. But another thing I found is that some some home appliances like. Um, <laughs> good example was I threw out a bread maker because the paddle in the middle of it was busted and I was told they don't make them anymore so I could do it. How old was it? Oh, it was probably seven years old. Okay. So um, got rid of it, took it down, I don't know, Goodwill or probably Jefferson Action Center or something. And it was probably a year later I had bought an, uh, a new one, found out the paddle that's in the new one it would also fit on the old one that I had. Oh. So whoever got that, all they had to do was order a $5 little piece to put in the middle of it, and they had a working bread maker. So, you know, just because they don't make them for that model specifically, it made me buy a new bread maker. So look You never had it apart, have you? I. See, that's why you don't know what's happened with that. Yeah, you know. Well, How did I, would I know? A big piece, you know? Yeah, so I got a new bread maker. That's, that's part of the American system. You throw it away and get a new one. Exactly, mm -hmm. but it really makes you mm -hmm. angry when you find out that. That's why you don't find too many shoe repairs around there. Well, if you have you ever gone to a shoe repair place that lately? It costs more than your shoe you buy. Exactly. That's what I know that. It's like pitch the shoes. It I didn't know. used to be that way. You're in love with the shoes, then uh, you pay for it. Yeah. Yeah, I took a nice pair of shoes in to have a heel fixed on it, and when they told me what it was going to be, I said, "Nope, those are gone." <laughs>
tons of stuff. Flashlight. And uh, so this is on there, and it, the car's hitting bumps, and when it pulled the car this way, it caused the ignition switch to malfunction and go off in the river. Now, if it was just the bare key, it apparently worked fine. But this, this again, is a foreseeable misuse that people will put. So how did they change that? Did they change They the had position? to change uh, something inside here. They, they had to beef but it you up. Have to Pull it out harder then, right? I mean, well, they just they just strengthened like the little um, I don't know the fingers that that hold this so that it could handle like up to two three pounds of weight. Stop. But um, you know that that's a great example of a foreseeable misuse. Like the product worked okay with the key alone, but given that people put all this stuff on it and it's just hanging there, and the car is hitting bumps and you get this even. I always get my wife. I'm like, I'll use my key. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> downforce stuff. and stuff um, that caused a problem. And so the GM is definitely liable because that's a foreseeable misuse to uh, overload the key fob. It's taken so many years to get to that point, it seems like. Oh. Uh, they knew about it a long time so ago, I mean, but, but it got lost in the right bureaucracy right? of a oh. large organization. <laughs> Well, actually, they... Uh, we've been using car keys forever. Mm -hmm. Never happened all of a sudden. Happened. Well, I but think, it was probably I think the people way it was have loaded, loaded the key fobs up more out of the last yeah, you're right. but years. Mm -hmm. You know, but it could have happened in the past. Maybe the, mm -hmm. the, the lock system is not as good. We can say it that way, too. Well, I know you're you know, saying uh, putting too many things is not good. The internals of the, the key are, you know, plastic. Well, if you look at the difference in a vehicle key versus a house key, you know, in the thickness of that. I mean, a house key you're just going to use. It's not going to stay in the door and hang. It does. There's not a problem if it falls out. But look at the difference in thickness in those two. And, and the thing is, the length of it is what kills you because the longer it is out, the more that pull down mm -hmm. affects. You know, uh, cars in the old days had a, a little short key. Yeah. A smaller key because it didn't have the electronics in it. Mm -hmm. So, so if you were over in uh, like Europe, would the liability be a lot less over there, or not? I have a comment about that. Uh, they don't have tort product liability; they have uh, regulatory product liability. So, um, if the manufacturer complies with government regulation on product design, they're exempt. So the government's controlling the design of everything. Here, we have kind of a hybrid of that. We have regulations on some stuff, but not everything. So, uh, but um, it, the, the regulation compliance thing, if you comply with the regulation and someone gets hit with a car, that's a legal defense for you to say, I was in compliance with the regulation. What does it go to? Yeah, he can be jury or judge. So if you're in a regulatory compliance situation, you don't have as much room for innovation, do you? Well, is you have to comply with the regulation, but you can go beyond that if you want. Right, let's say you come up with yeah. an electric car and you want to sell it in Europe, right? And they don't have any regulations about how to build an electric car, you know, like Tesla, I don't I don't know if this is the case, but the first electric car, you know, in this century in Europe will say, you know, they, they don't have any regulations about that. And then something goes haywire, someone gets killed. They have no recourse because they don't have uh, tort, um, I, I don't know what you would call it. Call it. Not that I know, but they don't have torts. So all the best they could do is go to their government agency I, I would and say, look, the, here's uh, a problem. Probably before the vehicle is allowed to be sold, there would be some sort Review or on a vehicle, you know, because that's a big investment and not some inherent danger. But who knows? Maybe a little run of the mill on the shop product. Uh, yeah, I wonder. Yeah. Then, uh, but the the thing is with GM, I was reading a uh, some low level engineer. I mean, it got the problem got fixed, and someone realized what the issue was, but. It didn't elevate up and do, uh, do the recall and get everything fixed again. 
Toronto was another issue. Yeah. I own one of those. You can sit out too. Yeah, so you know, they said they, the fix was like at the time four or five bucks a car. It was like peanuts. But some executive, you know, he's he's responsible of four or five times uh, three hundred thousand units a year. You know, and all of a sudden he's out a million bucks, and now his department looks like well, losing money instead of making money. You know, they they would weigh risk because it's kind of interesting the product liability insurance the way I understand it. They do not buy product label insurance because it would be outrageously expensive. They do a self-insure. They figure, well, we're going to get sued a few times due to things happening, and we'll just buy each case. And if it's occasional problems, probably that's the best way to do it. Yeah. But if it's a problem that starts repeating itself and becomes common, you know, then they're then they can go into punitive. If a court assigns punitive damages, who gets that money? Uh, the victims. The victims? Okay. Yeah. And yeah, their attorney. And their attorney. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the lawyer will take, uh, <laughs> depending on how far the case goes, Possibly. 20 to 40 percent. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, those things usually go into class actions. So that's like you have you know, thousands of people with the same. So then the, the court will set the, the rule, at least it's not a percentage. It's a big group. But that's, uh, those things can be, you know, PR disasters for the companies. You know, to handle them. Do you remember uh, the value jet plane crash in the, uh, mm, yeah. I think it was Florida or Georgia or somewhere, <coughs> where they had the oxygen bottles. That, that was in the Everglades. Airplane. Yeah, the, that hit. was the, the cargo car. Yeah, the yeah. Mm -hmm. And they had That was a subcontractor exactly. that did that. Yeah. yeah and that, that's an interesting issue that uh, what's the responsibility of the subcontractor versus the airline who's supervising the subcontractor. Do you know how it came out? I don't remember. The That's lawsuits will look for deep pockets, so yeah, they may get some out of the contractor, but they're gonna get more out of the airline, even yeah, if it's they, a contractor. Uh, that did it. Yeah, the airlines they, they carry insurance on that, but uh, probably the subcontractor. Sometimes I think the what I've seen in businesses, corporations will intentionally hire a subcontractor just to have that insulation. They, they mm -hmm. like to keep you know, uh, yeah. like liability barriers, yeah. and then mm -hmm. you know they can be pierced, but you know it takes some extra work. But the problem with that is that your coordination of information just gets worse. Because mm -hmm. I, I think the airlines, you know, they used to do all their own cargo and loading and own maintenance and everything, and then all of a sudden they're contracting out to all these people. Right. And, th and sometimes I think they don't, they really want the communication to be poor. So like they can say, well, we didn't wrong, know. You don't know. It's those guys. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> we didn't know they were not putting the bolt in correctly. We didn't know they were using this fake bolt from China, you know. How, how could we know to communicate? They won't communicate with us, they don't speak English. You know, is that a valid defense that's been used? Well, I you know I guess it comes down if it's reasonable to not have that knowledge, and uh, you know the, the responsibility of if you contract with someone, you're still you still should have responsibility for their final. I always think it's interesting you you could end up in front of people just like us making that decision, you know, uh, and as a jury. They're making the gigantic decisions that they may not even understand mm -hmm. totally, but it comes down to just people like us. So. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, man, um, a, I guess I would call it a distributor here in town. I don't know if you're familiar with Bennett Bolt here in town. Um, I'm not even sure they're still in existence, but they were buying um, bolts offshore from China mm -hmm. and Taiwan. I yeah, oh, they were, they were supposed to be grade fives and grade eights, 
and what was coming in were grade two labeled as five and eights and they ended up showing up in some uh, military vehicles and they had some major problems in war zones where their bolts were failing and um, so the feds came in with big tractor trailers and went over to Bennett Bolt and uh, manufa or, uh, distributors of fasteners around the country but Bennett Bolt was one of the one here in Colorado that was bringing in this cheap So they crap. were mismarked in China? Yeah, but Bennett Bolt was part of it. They were looking for cheap prices. So they should have known because they've been in this business for years and years. And, and so the feds showed up. Where they were obligated to test a sample of what came in to yeah. verify the yeah. And yeah. those bolts were not supposed to have been shipped to military purchases. They were only supposed to be U.S. manufacturers or Canada. And uh, these were not Canadian, they were not U.S., and every bolt is marked on the head with where it's manufactured. Um, they all have unique little symbols. And unless you're in that industry, you might not know specifically, but if they're heat-treated bolts, fives, eights, twelves for mining, that sort of thing, they have to be labeled as such where they were manufactured. And these are labeled by labeled wrong. Well, so they were forgeries. They, yeah, they were forgeries because they were labeled 5 and 8 and they were actually grade 2, which, which has no strength weaker. at all. I mean, it's just, it holds soft, two pieces yeah. together very soft. Hmm. So uh, they came in with big tractor trailers, went into the Bennett Bolt, loaded everything on it, and went off to some federal lab someplace on a military base. Same thing happened in the aircraft industry. They found bad bolts after a crash of an old airplane that the rudder fell off. Oh. And uh, this is back probably in the 70s or so, maybe yeah. the 80s. And uh, yeah, they, they traced it down to a bolt that wasn't uh, up to spec, that wasn't made of the right metal. And then the mm -hmm. FAA and the federal authorities went back and started looking at all these repair shops, pulling their bolts off the shelf and testing them and finding mm -hmm. out there were a bunch of forgeries. And they actually had some bad bolts that made it all the way into Air Force One. I'm not surprised. Yeah. It may have been, well, this this happened right in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, they were pretty, watching things pretty close about, about that yeah, time. Even uh, the Titanic, day. right? The coils of the steel uh, and the yeah. coils of the yeah. bolts. Yeah. Yes. The rivets. Yeah, that uh -huh. it causes a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the lift failure keystone was a material defect when the full wheel axle broke. Mm -hmm. Well, this particular issue that I was referring to, some of those bolts are very long, and, and Tom might know about this. There's a there's a bolt about this long that's supposed to be a grade five or a grade eight, which is higher tensile strength on it. And it was holding together a trailer to the, the, the cab of the, uh, the truck. <laughs> and um, what had happened is they brought in these foreign bolts and they were grade two, which is, I mean, it might hold a table to another <coughs> table. But they were pulling these trailers and they had an accident with one of them. And the, the distributor bolt company got sued over it because it was supplied. So. Well, my brother was towing something and he didn't have the right connection and everything. And he went over the edge, but it, it, it broke loose. Uh. And so it crashed the trailer, but it saved him because his car was hanging off the edge. So he was so glad that all that broke when it shouldn't have. That and case, I was yeah, I, I wanted to write. Ten minutes, and when I came up there, I saw his trailer totally oh. shredded, and I thought he's gone, he's gone. You know, and I got over the edge and saw his car hanging there. So, but we were kind of oh. happy that you know nothing was done right, and the whole thing was loose. So. Wow. <laughs> mm. um, I guess one one last thing I'm going to say is that. Uh, Whatever features you promote of a product, like its strength, weight capacities, whatever, you know, you better have testing and calculations to back them up. Because if you just make a claim, that will really open up the problem. Well, let's take a, a quick break and then um, come back. And is it about that? It's that time, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Take a quick break, you know where the restrooms are, and then come back, and then I'm going to 
go through a list of real world applications of liability, insurance, things you might not know of in the last 18 years or things that I've run across in the field or at trade shows and working with clients. Yes, yes. What about software? <laughs> yeah, that is a, that's especially, uh, that usually warranties will just claim consequential damages, like if the, if the software fails and it causes very expensive problems. Right, if you read the Microsoft uh, end user agreement for their operating system, it says you can't right. use this that, that's safety a standard, critical application. No consequential, yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. or they'll say something like, our liability is limited to but there are certain softwares and critical applications where performance or functional guarantee has to be made. So if it does happen, I think there's like additional testing and certification. What? The cost of the software failure. If you were to look at my, let's say, you know, I don't know a salon situation, it was 200 hours, a rule of thumb would say it was that it's probably going to cost about $40 to manufacture. Mm -hmm. well, well, I work with really guess that, but you know, there is almost 3,000 to 4,000 years of selling stuff to the military, right? Manufacturing stuff in the military, designing stuff in the military. And so, we had all those specs right now, all of a sudden, they're coming up with this. Whatever it is, you price know, you where it's crazy, as blah, blah, I said, blah, blah, blah. for me, it's So they spelled it all out. They're selling it in a supply. And they also have specifications for your all the systems, how to do inspections, how often, so where, in the process. So, which it's, all of which it's good, if you do this, to me, it's okay. okay. Well, then I went to this other but, company, uh, and they said, oh, we want to get ISO 9000. See, what so I said, okay, I know how to do know, all the, that crap. The I situation is, is here's what our quality program has those to are good. The guy who was running the whole thing was a salesman, said, Screw that. They got the I, ISO guy, they got the drunk guy, got the late, they got their service. Like you mentioned, Condi, I don't know. I guess people <laughs> have been in the business for 50 uh, years. It, so well, it all comes down to people. What's you going know, on that's going to be risky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. My creation, but that's whatever just I'm the way they play is, the game, and that's why I don't work there Kanye anymore. Condi doesn't know, <laughs> doesn't do it. Condi mm -hmm. never worked behind the chair to know how it's supposed to work. For 50 years, my arm, this arm, why it's damaged from holding it, why it, and not just me. A lot of it, as soon as they're about 40, 45, their arm doesn't do it. Because that hair dryer, eight hours a day, and it's not just holding it, it's shaking. It's That's true. I never, I never didn't think that. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shoulder, so, right yeah. Here. So how the hardest you start out of is a lot of people. They oh, don't yeah. know why yeah, it hurts. They feel like here. it's a physical okay. problem. So I work. They're going to sleep in the All night. This that stuff, pain. You know. and they, you know, yes, I did the so anyway, and so I'm trying to come up with a solution uh -huh. for that, making uh, it right. You know, our so product is a business. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. It's yeah. It's yeah. It's nothing. It's just, yeah. It's something. If you take the phone and talk to somebody, <coughs> on my own, he's a salesman. Mm -hmm. You know, like I go to the Las Vegas for a convention. Uh -huh. There's oh, about three, four thousand hair dryers. But uh, maybe there's something new. There's nothing new. Well, who's, who's selling? It's a salesman. Do you know anything about it? How it works? Uh, no, I, none of them. See, what I'm saying. So what I'm doing is something. Where I decided they don't want to do business with them anymore because I knew if something weight. happened, they would try uh -huh. to blame it on me. The you balance know, of where the handle yeah. is. Some people are, you know, why is yeah, you know, yeah. the, they're, yeah. they're all going to blow? You can see they're just rolling the dice every day. Is one of them going to break up, one month you know, before and after? And that this is not a big problem. Mm -hmm. But what it's doing yeah, to that's, people, you know, that's what's very But your design would relieve that? It would help a lot. 
just like if you drive from mm -hmm. here to whatever, LA mm -hmm. in your car, it's what are you going to be? How is your back going to be? Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you do for that? Can you tell me you you stretch my my eyes. Eyes. That's, that's one of them. You, you, you change the seat. Right. Come up with a little back. Okay. Do that. Yeah, right. 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 So the position will change so that will give you different muscle. Some of them don't. Those are the ones I have to have. You don't have time to work on another project. Because when you are driving, you hold the control for seven hours a day, which is six days a week. That's just that's one of the reasons. And, and the way mm -hmm. it does and whatever. So when you talk to I some big companies, Conair makes Pro cheap and uh -huh. That's what Conair uh -huh. does now. Right. Before it was good. Now yeah. and other people making the Now they're doing it yeah, I style. They're putting a uh, Ferrari and, mm -hmm. and they'll have a Ferrari uh, label on oh it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do they have something to do with, right. with Ferrari yeah. or oh. they have yeah. used their name? I don't know. So what I'm saying is, yeah. what I'm looking yeah. is, yeah. right now I'm designing it. That's a I'm going to have a, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a proto, mm -hmm. which yeah, I will make business. sure it was much more like I'm satisfied. I'm going to work with it myself. I still do it when I go to work. And I will see how it's work. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'm going to try to see what's wrong with it. It's not going to be perfect. I'm going to make it perfect as much as I know how. Well, it sounds like it's a good product, especially if there's somebody in the industry for some time and they start feeling this. And it's nothing like it right now as a designer. Right now, right now, like everyone is going to work special about it. You know, I can't explain it to you. Right. But uh, it's different than any uh -huh. other you've yes, seen on the market, which there is, as I said, three thousand. I can say about eight thousand or ten thousand there. Right. Well, you know, I was there there you know, and every household will have one or two. And those refineries, I was never really And uh, <coughs> uh, sometimes you get tired, you put it down, and you start with it. It's like that. They don't know why. Some of them get big, some of them get heavy, some of them get wrong. Why is it right to have it? What is the reason for it? If it's a light, it's cheap, where is it? Well, get that design then, because I think you get that sourced, you know, once you get a quote on it, on the manual. Right now, I'm too far away from that. Now, you see, like what you said, if anything happens, I go to China myself. Make sure it's going to be what I want. Again, I don't have a legal. See, that's my problem is I had done this ten years ago when I had no man on it. And now, I cannot, like, there's not enough changes I can do so I can make it do that. See what I'm saying? And I don't know if I make it, if it's going to pass, because I already have the old one. Like so I'm going to go through that review where you have it for one year, whatever mm -hmm. it's called. Yeah, yeah patent like pending. It no, it's not. The provisional much. application, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. one year, right? Right. That's, that can't be renewed. No. 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 Not unless you change what it is. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm afraid of buying a new Toyota. Because yeah. Yeah. if you remember, there was a big interaction. I don't know if you're allowed to. I didn't see. I mean, I can go through all that expense, and it's not going to... Did you do a provisional because application the 10 years ago, or was yeah. that a design patent, or what was it? I don't know how they're dealing with it. A yeah, design yeah. patent? You wonder why they build it. Uh, What's the difference? Oh, for cooling. We want that water. Um, water. Yeah, they have to have I think we'll, we'll let Roger fluids. explain that, because I can design is the way something There's looks. A utility patent is the way it functions. It's, it's, it's right. 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 design. Right. All, all the the design of, uh, of a, uh, of of a, high of a air dryer, right? For, right. for example, just the, the line, yeah, the cool. design, how cool, cool it looks, but, but, but not the functioning, not the features inside. But your design patent could end up 
plutonium. Making yeah, uh, uh, another like filing is, of a utility patent. Yeah. 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 Obvious. If I just saw it, let me see what he thinks. What I really didn't know which one it is. Yeah. There was any hope I get into it, you know. Because 10 years, that doesn't sound right for It's 14 patent. For, it's for design patents. 14 for design, for design and, 20 and 20 for utility. Well, utility. That, that's really, that's, you see, what's happened is it's the patent was good, but my lawyer, I was out of the country, so he didn't, they didn't get paid. I didn't oh. get paid. That's what's Ooh. happened. I didn't pay them. How long ago, though? Uh, 2000. Let me see. It's too late at this point. Fourteen years ago, so the if it was a design path, it would be expired. Be expired right? by now. Mm -hmm. 2014, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. but they would still use it as prior art, right? Oh, sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's what do nobody art. can 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 uh, uh, make another uh, air dry. I don't know. Like I'm it? talking right. The same. And you can't right. either. Public yeah. the public it is, it's but you get part. no protection on it, right. and you oh. can't get another patent because that will. That's that will come problem. up as prior art. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. I'm sure Roger probably told you that. I have to do some changes to that kind of mm -hmm. all the changes I could do for the hair dryer. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. What the, what the mm -hmm. inside functioning? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Is anything special on the on the functioning? Yeah, but that functioning it was in the patent. No, because it was designed patent. I think and there may be something else so that you could do. Yeah. Well, let's um, get back. Everybody's got their goodies. Yeah. Um, Doc has a question Doc, about his the, uh, patent. You have that the maintenance fees weren't paid on that, right? Was it a design or a utility? Utility. It was a utility. Yeah, design. Yeah, I think it's only got four years left on its life. Hmm. But um, big news in your favor. gotten a lot more lenient on uh, we call revivals <laughs> <laughs> reviving dead applications that either mm. fees weren't paid responses weren't made and mm -hmm. went into abandonment so uh, in the old days you have to file a petition a petition of the patent office means you want to get a rule waived for you on something that you can lay out your case pay mm -hmm. the fee and then wait months and months and months and then Mm -hmm. come back, okay, or no, then you could appeal it to, to a regular uh, federal court. So what they did now on some of the petitions, which are all the time delay ones, so this is no response to office action, not paying issue fees, not paying maintenance fees. You, you blew a, a deadline and your uh, patent abandoned. You do what's called e-petition and you pay I'd say on average, it depends on your uh, entity, but an average, say, about a thousand extra. And you pay all the back fees that you owe, like your unpaid issue fee and maintenance fees, and you get an automatic grant of revival. So that's a good deal. You're paying the money, but you know you're mm -hmm. going to get it instead of this uncertainty. So he might have four years. He would have to pay all his unpaid maintenance fees plus the. It's over five thousand, quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. But it, at least when you pay it, you know you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. So that I, I consider that very pro inventor. Um, well, if that's within your budget, with also the manufacturing and everything else, and taking that to market, that make that makes sense to do that. But if you're not going to go forward with it, well, don't bother. What the patent? Right. Yeah. How about the person that, that sees that abandoned and, and goes and uses that? Are they, when they revive that thing, are they liable? Or are they not liable? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you I know, there's I someone that brings up the, that situation. I think they could probably argue that before the revival, they were not liable. If they, if they produced, like when they got notice, if they got a cease and desist and the patent's active again, and they continue to infringe, mm -hmm. then they would already be able to have right. knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think you certainly have a case of, you know, I said, well, this, this patent expired, but I was using the technology. Mm -hmm. Sure. If I go 
down to the patent office, will they give me that information, what it is and how much it costs or what they need? Is that how it works? Or, or no, we just do it all online. You know, it's, it's you and the server. <laughs> 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 That's the, the whole point is they call it e-petition. And they're, they're uh, giving people financial incentive to file, do everything electronically. It used to be you only paid a $50 penalty for filing a paper. Now you pay a $400 penalty for filing a paper. So they're, they're pretty serious about that. And I think it'll probably go to where they just flat out won't accept people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe someone like Jim Poole is still insisting on using <laughs> mm -hmm. Might have to give up and retire. Uh, I was tired to go to the post office ev every every other day, so I say no more. Mm -hmm. right. no more, no more paper. Electronic could be great. Right. Yes. Oh. Oh. But anyway, that's uh, that's a benefit. Like so, if you if you blow a day. I'm going to give you some examples of some inventors that I've run across in various capacities. Um, I think each one of these I have, no, there's one of them I have not worked with, but the other ones I have, okay, or consulted with them on them. Um, one I saw at a Minnesota Inventors Conference where I was a guest speaker there, and I was looking for products to you know, work with and consult with people. And there was a back traction chair. It, it, it was a, a chair that you'd sit in and it would you could adjust it up to give yourself traction while sitting as opposed to laying in a bed for back you know, traction oh, on your neck. Did they and grab you? Where was the pressure to pull up? I think it, there was a strap that went around you know, your chest mm -hmm. and then around your waist to hold you into the chair. And then the traction it lifted, okay. And um, well, anyway, it felt good to sit in that chair and do it. And the guy had been using it on himself because he had had an accident and needed traction, and he didn't want to go to the hospital to have the traction done on him all the time or to rehab or PT. I don't know what he was going to at that time to do it. So he constructed this thing for himself, and he went on. Um, he actually secured a patent on it. Unfortunately, he went through a particular company that's notorious for doing lousy patents. So the patent he had was very weak. The other thing is that because it was kind of a fun little thing to demonstrate at this show, everybody was sitting in it. Well, when I <coughs> when I talked to him after the show, because he was in Minnesota, and um, I said, you know, send me copies of you, you know, your patent, give me the patent number that's issued, and give me a history of what's been going on. And um, he said, well, he said, you know, this is ready to go to market. I want to start manufacturing these. I've got the money to go forward. Um, he said, but I'd really like to, you know, eventually license it, but I want to manufacture some and get them out there. Well, here is the problem, okay? The first thing, the patent was weak to start with, so no one's going to license it. The second thing was that he swore up and down it was a class one with the FDA, so there wouldn't be a problem with the FDA. Um, the other issue was he didn't have any insurance on it, even his prototypes. And he had already given a couple of them to people to try. Hmm. High liability. Um, he should never have had that on a demonstration floor at a trade show because if somebody got hurt, you got a problem. Okay. So um, when we did the research for him with the FDA, because he kept saying, well, there are traction devices all over, so it, you know, it's no problem. It's class one, right? Class one FDA means you don't really have to go and do anything. Well, we, what we find out is after we got a uh, uh, FDA specialist involved and checked it out, it's not a class one, it's a class two. And so he, it would when cost he, him. When a, he said it was class one, did he have like an FDA uh, intermediary or expert telling him that? Not until I got involved. 
That was just his assumption. That was his assumption his because assumption. he knew there were all these traction devices out there, and his was just a little different, more convenient to use at home. You know, and you don't have to go to a physical therapy office or to a hospital for the traction. So he was using this device, but um, you know, after we did the the research and got an FDA consultant involved to give us a you know a written, this is the class. What we find out is that no, it was not a class one. It was a class two, which really comes down to he can't manufacture. He has to go through the FDA process. He's probably looking at a quarter million dollars to even get that going with the FDA. There's no way. So you know that one got dropped because of that. So you know here he's got he's paid for a patent. He's paid for all the prototyping. He's going to a trade show. He actually won uh, a gold award at that show for having the most creative product or the most right. useful product. Doesn't mean it's manufacturable or that you can put it on the market. Right. It wasn't marketable. But it took us a while to get through that process and learn that because when I got involved, you know, I'm looking at all the different <coughs> aspects to say, okay, what could stop this thing from going forward? And you don't want to get too far down the process before you start looking at all these things like product liability, uh, you know, what is the liability factor? Are you going to have to go through, you know, certain regulations or meet specs? Um, ANSI standards is another one. We were talking about bolt categories. They come under ANSI standards. So if you're not familiar with those standards and you're creating a product, that can get in your way of proceeding if you don't even know to ask the question. So a lot of time it's what you don't know that's going to get you into trouble down the road if you aren't, you know, looking at all of this stuff. So there, there was nothing you could do in the no. design to like take it back to an FDA classroom? Uh, no. And, and the patent was written so poorly that already it was, I mean, if it was so good. So you had a product? Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it, it for for multitude of reasons. I mean, not just the weak patent, but also the liability issue and what he was gonna have to go through with FDA. Yeah, the FDA, right. Yes. So it, it killed it <coughs> in the water. Um, another one was a, a woman who came to me, she did child care out of her home. And she had a van and it had, you know, the bench seats at that time, and she there were no seat belts. So she wanted to take multiple kids in this van to either pick them up or take them home or to go on little outings and things like this. Whoa. So she put together a child restraint. It was actually well conceived. And you could put multiple kids on this bench seat. She had to go through product testing right. for this kind of a device to hold children in a vehicle yeah. because mm -hmm. it's transportation. So we did all the research, but the cost of doing that. Is that the ANSI testing? No, there is a there are several uh, companies in the United States that will actually do testing on child seat vehicle restraint safety uh, stuff. Uh, right, they specialize yeah. in that. So she was she made up safety seats like this, multiples to go there for testing. But um, the liability alone on that, if they're made, is so high that the, the amount of uh, customers that would use something like that was so small that it made it not marketable. You, you know what I'm saying? Right. Okay, yeah. the cost of all the testing, right. and she had started the testing, because like, we tracked it down and went through what that process was gonna be. She started that, but when it came down to the liability issue, it does not make it viable in the marketplace. Right because you know the number of vehicles that mind. don't have right. seat belts in them yeah. were becoming fewer and fewer not more it wasn't a growing market yeah, the market was going away the market was going away as well so that kind of blew that one and again it's the the liability so whenever you look at it, something that deals with children you got to be concerned um, electrical appliances is UL issues come up um, is you have to pass certain certain things with UL approval in order to get certain electrical products out. Lighting is, is one of them. A lot of these grow operations in town now are buying lighting that's not UL approved. If there's a fire and the place burns down, guess what? Your house, your insurance will not cover it. So, you know, it's 
So if you how can you buy lighting that's not UL approved? I, I thought like everything at Home Depot <laughs> was UL approved. Is it not? All right. We let's had a metal shop and we built all kinds of different lighting things. Oh, okay. And so anybody could do that. I yeah. suppose we yeah. had to go get a UL approved. And way mm -hmm. back in the seventies, it you know it wasn't that hard. I'll bet it's way harder today. Yeah. Okay. And and the, where it's happening most now is in the uh, marijuana growing because people are growing marijuana in their basements oh, yeah. and they're using these high pressure sodium lights which have a lot of heat in them um, and even even the induction light which ha uses a lot less electricity and you don't need a lot of uh, ventilation but still if you have an electrical problem a lot of these things are being brought in from offshore and they're not meeting UL approval and um, because they're not they won't cover it and another thing is if there's more than one component and you're putting them together one part may be UL approved, the other one isn't. It negates the UL approval on the other one. Mm -hmm. right. So again, let your, your house burns down, your insurance will not cover it. Mm -hmm. So those are little things that you need to be aware of when you're manu you know, creating products about the liability issue, and this is product liability, obviously, that most people don't, you know, you're not aware of. So, um, uh, well, also, if you, if you commercially use anything that was normally personal use, that's different insurance. Yeah. Like uh, like your house insurance, if you got a little business in there, something mm -hmm. happens, they go, that's a commercial venture, we don't cover that. Mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. yeah, or your car, if you change your mm -hmm. car to a part-time taxi, your insurance doesn't cover it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, there's another one. Guys uh, from Brighton, Colorado came to me. I love the product. It was like a lawnmower, and it um, it put out carbon monoxide. Obviously, you know, running it, carbon monoxide coming out. So what they did is they created this thing that cooled the carbon monoxide coming out of a lawnmower, basically. Built it on this platform with wheels. They take it out in the field and they'd run the thing down a gopher hole. Well, because the carbon monoxide was heated, was too hot, the gophers had just run out the other end because they, the heat bothered. They're going to run out. So what they did is they created coils, patented this thing, and they put coils in it. It cooled the carbon monoxide coming out of there so the gophers didn't even know they were being poisoned up. Great product. Got rid of them like now. Killed all the gophers, all the ground, you know, whatever. Well, they, I don't think they have it on the market yet. I know they're using it on farm fields because of the problems with digging up the soil. But here's the issue on liability. Um, Robin Williams just committed suicide. Wouldn't it be easy to commit suicide with something like this? My totally my, unintended. My insurance guy did that. Speaking of insurance, killed his whole family. So that's a foreseeable misuse. So foreseeable misuse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even though they're still using the product, and I, I think they probably had a patent on it by now. Um. I'm not sure I'd want that. I mean, if you're looking at euthanasia, it might be a great thing down the road if that were a possibility. <laughs> you just go to bed and go to sleep. But, um... What? <clears throat> a lot of chemicals are used to get rid of pests or poisonous. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've all got this unforeseen, uh, you know, consequences if you use it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I mean, that th it would be hard to use that thing the wrong way. I mean, you'd have to go out and buy it. It's not like your car. Everybody's got a car. That's right. Right? That's right. You have to go buy this gizmo, hook it up to your lawnmower. you got to have the right kind of lawnmower. Well, yeah. Well, it's actually the, the motor was built into it on this frame. Oh, okay. Because of the way it was being used. Uh -huh. But I could see that. I mean, I could see an application that they hadn't thought about down the road for the same product if you're looking at Kevorkian. Yeah, hydrogen cyanide. I mean, it'd be a heck of a lot easier than putting injections in people, right? So there's a another. So so that that might not be a problem. It might be a feature. It might be a feature, <laughs> right? Could be. Depends on how you look at it. Okay. Another whole new market here. That 
vector execution, right? Yeah, right. It probably worked better than that execution <laughs> that went wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so anyway, that was you know that was another liability type thing that and a, a use that wasn't foreseen by them, but the product works for what they were using it for. What did they charge for something like that? You know, I don't even know. I wanted to work further with them because I saw applications for it, but um, you know, I don't think they they went. I think these guys were really uh, selling a one off to farmers to use in their fields so that they could plow and not have you know things going down in these gopher holes and you know get rid of the the, the pests. So. Well, I'm going to remember that next time because I've tried that a few times. I'm going to just cool it first. Yeah, that's that's what it takes. You know, they had coils and they cooled it right <coughs> down, so they didn't know. Um, another another um, uh, guy came to me with the idea about retrofitting vehicles to use hydrogen, and um, had a way of doing this that you could do it in your garage. And some people have been doing that already. Well. When you do that, it negates the uh, your warranty on your vehicle. Sure. And he didn't anticipate that. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> you know, inventors come up with things. They say, "Well, gosh, this be it make a great business. I can do this in my garage. I can convert these. I've already done it with a couple of them. How about marketing it? Can we go yeah. forward? No. <laughs> okay." So um, I don't think you'd have a lot of business if people knew that it, you know, invalidated the warranty on their vehicle. Plus, there's all kind of mm -hmm. safety right. did he, regulation. Did he said he right? Yeah, <laughs> he knew how to do it. In that case, a lot of you know risk and liability mm -hmm. because of the hydrogen. <laughs> Where do you get the hydrogen? Well, he he came to me with with a, a list of about five different business opportunities that he thought. Um, he had been laid off of his job <coughs> and had a, a nice little nest egg and said, you know, here are five business opportunities and I want to run these by you and see what you think works. And the one that, that I recommended did work. He ended up putting the product on the market, selling it, and ended up licensing the product after it was out there. But uh, this particular product was a no-go. Um, another um, guy, and this comes up quite frequently, a lot of people have additives they want to put in gas tanks to improve mileage oh, on vehicles. Yes, yes. Same thing, invalidates the warranty on the vehicle. You okay. cannot do that. Um, yeah. well, different kind right. of that's, that's material alteration. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. um, there was an inventor here in the group, uh, Rocky Mountain Inventors Association, or Um, Frank Armbruster, who um, he's deceased now, but um, he was notorious for putting things on the market without having um, any kind of liability insurance or, and he didn't care. Um, and he, are you anybody here familiar with what Necco wafers are? It's a candy. Uh, back in the '60s, they were really, really popular. It was a little roll it's in there, a, about. It's a disc. It's yeah, it's a little it disc. Like a quarter. Yeah, yeah about the size it, but of a I quarter. I never what they were called. Okay. Yeah, they're called Necco. N E C C O. I think they, they are. I love those flavors. things. Yeah. I about killed myself at 16 though, because I I had one in my mouth and I took a drink. Oh, you went to. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah I about killed myself. But. <laughs> no, I'll never forget those things. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, Frank made a toy, a roll of toys like that, that were um, it looked more like a wheel. It was. You remember these things? They interlocked. Tiddly winks. I think it's called tiddly winks. Well, it. But these things had little slots, and they would they would fit together. Yeah, and you could you could make long yeah, rows of them like build things. Mm -hmm. you could build mm -hmm. stuff. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there are two issues there. One is they were the size that a child under choking three years old, a choking hazard, um, was uh, you know an obvious one right there. But there was, I think it was Kalamazoo, or there's a uh, toy store here in town that took on some of them, but I don't think they carried them for very long. But he just 
put warnings on it. And I mean, there are those labels. I mean, there are pieces like this. Kids can yeah. choke on those. Sure. They're on the market. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it this way and this way. I mean, yeah, somebody mm -hmm. has said if we sell enough of these things and we get one lawsuit every year and we have right. to pay a million well, dollars for I'm every lawsuit, is, we'll still make money. Mm -hmm. I think the Lego does some disclaimer on the age. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, very so age appropriate on it. Yeah. So right. so that you that see it on the floor of every house you walk in. Oh, there, there's the the Lego. Uh -huh. right, right. Right. But okay. Lego is big enough, they also have product liability. So they label it and they have product liability. Here, this guy's putting out a child's product. And all he's doing is labeling it. No warning. No warning. No. <laughs> Are these made out of plastic then? Uh huh. So you can make them cheap then? Real cheap. Real right. Yeah. Oh. So, you know, those are just some examples of things that can, you know, that I've seen out there that have gotten in the way of people actually getting products out there or, in Frank's case, doing it I don't think the, the without huge risk. Won't take yeah, most of them See, won't. That's, that's what I yeah, but this one little private okay. kazoo is that what it is on Cherry Creek? Are you familiar with it? Yeah, kazoo. Kazoo, yeah. that's it. Yeah, but they they took some of them in their store at one time. And test marketed it for them, but other other big retailers wouldn't take it. The liability you wouldn't have the insurance. Any, what are you doing, Mike, on anything that you're working on right now that's making progress? I have so many things I'm working on and <laughs> can't get to what I want to get on. So I'm working with Roger on some stuff. Mm -hmm. so. Feel like you're making some progress? No, I really, I get tied up in, in rentals and other things and, mm -hmm. and I don't get to work on my stuff. So. Mm -hmm. How about you, Bill? Uh, mostly just doing consulting stuff. Uh, wondering about liability in the consulting business. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who to talk to about that because you know most of the stuff I've done has been uh, just like business management stuff. There's no safety involved, and I'm a monster on reliability and testing and record keeping and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So I, I've got a lot of confidence in what I do. Systems. Uh, I sit with the users for quite a while, make sure they know how to use it, find anything that, if there are any um, traps that mm -hmm. I put in the system for them to fall into, I find out about it right away and I close those out, you know. But I'm still, uh, still, you know, as we move more and more into a more, uh, you know, it's not more of a litigious mindset. Everybody wants to blame somebody else mm -hmm. for what's going on. I'm becoming more and more concerned. Even though I do due yeah. diligence and I have all this documentation, if somebody loses a thousand dollars or a million dollars, you know, and they want to come after me, then I still have to defend myself. I have right. to pay somebody a lot of money to defend me and present my. Well, there are report. companies that specialize in errors and omissions. Yeah. So. I've, uh, yeah. You know, insurance. Um, the companies that I know that utilize that most are real estate brokers. Mm -hmm. So. Um, at one time I had a broker's license in Colorado, I've let it go inactive. So I'm not up to date on that kind of stuff anymore. But um, you might want to check with a real estate company in town and ask mm -hmm. who provides their error and omissions insurance mm -hmm. and then contact that company because if they're providing errors and omissions for real estate, they may also either provide it for your type of business right. or know who would. Right. <coughs> But it's called E and O insurance, and and when it comes to consulting, that's what it would be. But yeah, you know, and most people don't get it unless they're doing something that, like, you're working with somebody's mainframe or a computer, or, you know, something that's that would have a high liability or shut the company down for a while, and it was some error you made, you could have liability there. Right, right. But they also kind of gauge, okay, what's what's the likelihood of there being a major problem. Right, right. Yeah, and my bag is high reliability systems anyway. Mm -hmm. So when I build a system for somebody, they're thinking reliability, I'm thinking high reliability. 
because I come from a high reliability background. I know how to do that stuff. I know it's less expensive to build high reliability in up front uh -huh. than it is to deal with lack of reliability later on, especially in the software business. It's mm -hmm. very much so. So and, and it's kind of the culture that I came up in. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've, and I've never had a problem, you know, with my stuff breaking down mm -hmm. after the first couple weeks getting bugs worked out and finding out the users didn't tell me what they should have told me right? yeah. about, uh -huh. about their business. So yeah. well, how come I can't find this out? They didn't tell me you needed it. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll write you a new report for that. You know, no big deal. Uh, so, uh, but uh, like I say, I'm getting, as the environment changes over time, I'm becoming a little less comfortable, you know, just running on my own, mm -hmm. my own, you know, documentation and stuff. Do you know a, a real estate broker? Oh, yeah. Okay. You could probably just call a, like a metro broker's office yeah. or something and, and a manager would probably be a good source to find that. Or just type in Arizona Missions Insurance Denver into yeah. Google. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you remember, was it very expensive? Do you know? No. Because one of the things with real estate is, well, I was in commercial real estate. Um, but in residential real estate, there is a, um, the real estate commission has insurance on all their licensed brokers anyway. Um, so if somebody doesn't represent something correctly at a house um, and it ends up costing you because they didn't disclose that. I didn't know about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and the broker knew about it. Uh, yeah. Their error, okay, not that the land or the house owner didn't tell you, but the, the broker didn't broker tell you and knew it, okay? There is a, well, years ago it was a $50,000 liability, you know, that the real estate commission automatically provided. So if you put, you know, placed a claim, then they would pay that to the person who bought the house. Some known issue that you weren't aware of. Yeah, some mass murder was committed there, and they didn't disclose <laughs> that. Didn't tell you it was haunted. Yeah, it didn't tell you it was haunted, and you know, you're being spooked. Um, so you just call it ghost. It's ghost. Yeah, it's that's ghost. Exactly. Ghost. Uh, right. But the arrows and emission insurance is is an individual thing too. I remember working for one guy in a small company who uh, who had the insurance for his whole practice. So yeah. And they're, like I said, they're companies that kind of specialize in that area. I, uh, I assume that uh, they, if you do business with them, they'll kind of help you review your operations and your procedures and your record keeping to make sure that you're doing all the things that are the are wise. It might be, yeah. I, I really don't know beyond okay. the real estate industry in particular about errors and emissions. You know, there are certain procedures that in order to have a, a license, you must, you know, abide by certain mm -hmm. things, you know, documentation um, and disclosures and that sort of thing. So if you fail that, then you're, you better have well, some yeah, errors and omissions. Uh, we're not telling you you, you failed this condition. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, insurance is all about exclusions. Perhaps. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for coming tonight, and I'm sorry the guy with the insurance wasn't here, but.